The Happy Warrior Podcast, conservative commentary on the news of the day from a more positive perspective. Ta da! Hello and welcome. This is Happy Warrior Pete. This is the Happy Warrior Podcast, uh, the conservative talk radio show that tries to build a bridge between left and right to see our common humanity and treat each other as brothers and sisters. Uh, in this wonderful country that is the United States of America. I'm here again, solo, flying solo across the skies. I'm without uh, God King Robert Melling. We will have another episode with Mr. Melling before we get to Christmas, but unfortunately, till then, you're stuck with me. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day or night to listen to this. I hope whatever you're doing while you're listening uh, is productive or happy, or maybe you're just sleeping to this. Maybe I'm just lulling you off with my beautiful voice, with the melody that my timbre brings. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's great to be here again with you. I love this podcast. That song by uh, Bump of Chicken that I always open with, the song's named Karma, in case you want to know where that, what that song is. My favorite song of all time. I don't know. I just love it so much. I discovered it when I was in high school, and it's just, just stuck with me all these years. It, it, you, even now, when I listen to it, it almost brings me to tears. Beautiful song. Um, so what are we going to talk today? I have a huge episode today. I'm shooting for at least 90 minutes. I want to talk about Twitter. I want to talk about Russia. I want to talk about uh, transgender a little bit. I want to talk about a little bit about the border. We got lots of great stuff here. I worked really hard putting this together. I hope you learn from it. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you can learn, take what you've learned here and share it with your neighbor. Share it with your sister. Share it with the co-worker that's always mouthy about politics. You know, try to, to inform people about the facts and find common ground. And that's, that's the goal of this podcast. It's about teaching and helping people to teach others. Um, so where are we going to go? Well, I did not want to talk about this. Um, I really did not want to talk about it, but apparently it needs to be talked about. The caravan. I did not want to talk about the caravan because it's so politically charged. I felt that there wasn't a really a good way to convince others to see this in a different light. We now have more stories and more polls and more evidence where I feel at this point that we can say definitively, uh, we can give you know a strong argument for or against. And I, I should point out before we start, I love immigration. I love legal immigration. I think in the United States of America, this is my more libertarian side, a little bit of the conservative, you know, we should allow as much legal and safe immigration as possible, but we should be able to vet who is coming in. We should vet them, you know, we should find out if they're criminals. We should vet them for disease if they need um, that, you know, treatment or being quarantined. We should be able to uh, try to attract the very best people in this world, not just the low-wage workers, though there, I have nothing against them, but we want the scientists and the leaders and the entrepreneurs, you know, people, if they want to be American and assimilate into our society and adopt American values, you know, the, which came from the Scottish Enlightenment, you know, the, the values of hard work, bourgeois values, you know, we believe in families, we believe in marriage, we believe in treating your neighbor, we believe in giving it, you know, 150% at work, we believe in, you know, learning English. I'm sorry that's hard to say, but in this country, we're an English-speaking country that we you know we are a, uh, our daughter country of England, and that's just part of how it goes. I, I don't know how we can get around it. Not that you can't be bilingual, but you need to have a primary language, and that language is English. Okay, so you've got you got all the way. So now you understand my position on it. So where are we going to move to this? Okay, so the caravan that we have, the, there are many caravans, by the way, that are coming. This is politically charged. There are people that are funding it. George Soros and the Open Society Foundation is just one of them. Um, it's just, it's a very heavily politically thing, you know, very photo op. Throughout the caravan, we, the, you'd see these people get in trucks and buses, drive a certain way, stop, have everyone get out so they could talk to the journalists and get photo ops, and they get back in the bus. <laughs> just ridiculous, just ridiculous stuff. So what's it's also spurred me was this photo that's going everywhere. I'm seeing it on Facebook a ton. It's just driving me nuts because it's obviously a photo op. It's the same strategy they use with the Israelis and the Palestinians where they set the Palestinians up to, for this perfect picture with children and a mother and tear gas and, and you know, just how those cruel Israelis attacking those just innocent Palestinians. You know, the old dichotomy like I talked last week that uh, it's at so many universities where it's always us versus them. It's always good guys and bad guys and there is no nuance, nothing in between. It's only angels and demons and nothing else. 
Um, and that is just not the case. Uh, so we're going to talk about the migration on factual terms, not just emotional terms, and not just based on propaganda photos. <laughs> I mean that that's so that's so, I mean that's propaganda 101. You know where you portray where this this dichotomy between evil and and the good. You know the oppressor versus the innocent. I mean, man, that's that's easy stuff. That's psst. it's sad that we are all falling to it still. All right, so where are we going to start? Well, I'm going to use NBC because we start with facts on the show, right? So let me set up the clip before I share it with you. Um, these, This is at the NBC News, and they're interviewing a reporter who's on the ground next to the caravan, caravan in uh, Tijuana. And it is really interesting. Listen to what this reporter has to say, and I'm going to give this guy props for his courage for trying to tell the truth. And he does it the same way I would. He tries to approach them for a place they understand and then tries to share the, with them the facts. So it's a smart move to do. So major props to the reporter. His name is uh, Gotti Schwartz. Gotti Schwartz. So here is the clip. Who says, it's not women and children, it's, it's stone cold criminals. So my first question is, you're in that tent camp. Besides that family, give us the profile of who is there mostly and what are they looking for? Because it seems as though, to your point, they don't actually have the necessary information so they know how to cross the border. There could have people, there could be people yesterday who were running because they thought it was their only chance. Right. And it's very difficult because this has become such a polarizing issue. If we kind of take a walk, you'll, you'll be able to see for yourself. Again, this is the inner sanctum of the shelter. Uh, so uh, you're, you're going to see a lot of families here, a lot of uh, women and children. Uh, but the, the truth is the majority of the people that are part of this caravan, especially outside, if we can make our way all the way over there, uh, we'll show you the majority of them are men. So uh, when this becomes a polarized political issue, the United States, you have people on one side uh, that point and say uh, there are women and children here, and that is true. And then there are others who point and say uh, these are, are men that, that are trying to cross the border, and that's true too. Um, from what we've seen, the majority are actually men, uh, and some of these men have not articulated that need for asylum. Instead, uh, they have talked about you know going to the United States for a better life and to find work. Uh, but if we come this way here, we're just going to uh, leave. This is where, where there's a, a food bank that's set up and you've got a long line of men earlier we saw about five six hundred men standing in line waiting for uh, food and it looks like that's dwindled down huh well isn't that interesting it's mostly men what I, I, I didn't hear that where did you guys hear that I'm amazed I give him major props for having the courage to say that yeah unlike what you're being told and like most uh, immigration it's a single man Typically, it's single men that are in their late teens, 20s, even 30s that are the ones that uh, participate in illegal immigration. Um, even when it's legal, they're often the ones that come f forward first. We saw this in Europe. We see it here in America. Uh, that's just how it is. Now, he, they, here's a, the NPC reporter, Gotti Schwartz, had this later on. He figured out the numbers. He said there were 5,738 people being housed at the migrant shelter. 3,676 of those are men. Again, 3.6 thousand of them are men. Only 1,060 are women. 1,002 are children. Isn't that interesting? Majority men. Majority men. I know that seems so crazy. You know, it's 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 two to one but at least, but that's how it is. It's more like three to one to be honest. Uh, yeah, majority men. I know everyone wants to say that these are families, but are, the truth is there are families, but there are more men. I don't, I don't know how you move around that fact. That's just the truth, okay? Uh, so what other facts should we probably say? What other facts should we look into? Well, let's just go here. Let's hear from what it was like for the Border Patrol agents that were on the ground. We've done this before. Let's talk to someone that, that actually was on the ground and was at that scene that we all saw on the television of the tear gas and the families. Uh, sorry. <laughs> here it is. This is CNN is the channel that's doing this so you know i'm trying to give you a different news source than just say like fox all right clip here we're going to hear from agent rodney scott of the san diego chief border patrol talk about a more comprehensive process to fixing the situation at the border if making the process quicker uh, would make your life easier you did answer though uh, that question largely you said that you arrested mostly men at the border there the pictures have included women and children and there are those questioning again the use of the tear gas on the women and children is is there some 
barrier in place to the use when women and children, children specifically, uh, might be at risk? So the use of that, those uh, less lethal techniques are, are uh, when the threat is to our personnel or to protect others, you've got to do what you got to do. Uh, what I find unconscionable is that would, people would intentionally take children into this situation. What we saw over and over yesterday was that the group, the caravan as we call them, would push women and children towards the front and then begin basically rocking our agents. So there's different types of uh, tools we use, different types of CS deployment. Um, we try to target specifically the instigators, specifically the person assaulting the agent. Uh, but as you saw from the video, once that uh, chemical is released, it does go through the air. I was in an area where I actually inhaled quite a bit of it yesterday as well. That's what's going to happen in those situations. Huh. Again, how interesting. You mean that it wasn't just families just being attacked with tear gas just out of nowhere? They were just sitting, minding their own business, and then tear gas is like, oh, why? Why? Not the children! Not the children! N wait, wait. You mean the mo the uh, innocent migrants were using families, women and children as human shields? So then the, they would think that the Border Patrol wouldn't retaliate at all? Huh. So they were putting women and children in danger. How interesting. How, how moral. Wait, no. That's the opposite of moral. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite of being good. And that is the same strategy we see with the Palestinians over and over and over again, where they work out of hospitals and preschools and elementary schools, and where you know where women and children are. They'll that's where they'll put their centers so that the Israelis can't fight back. Same strategy. Uh, it's it's immoral, by the way, to use women and children as human shields. Completely wrong in my book. There's no defending that, no justification of that at all. Um, now, what's the next narrative that we have to uh, shed some light on? Well, the narrative is is that President Trump is the most evil man in the history of evil men to ever occupy the White House when it comes to the issue of illegal immigration. And that's just not the truth. He is only continuing a policy that's been there since uh, the Reagan years. Okay, I, I, now the day, I don't have back it up, but my understanding is this was done during Bush and this uh, probably done during Clinton. When it was definitely done during President Obama. In fact, President Obama was perhaps even worse. Uh, he, during the years of 2012 to 2016, this is from Homeland Security. This is their data. Uh, Department of Homeland Security. They say that tear gas was used by a U.S. Border Patrol agent 79 times from 2012 to 2016. They had incidents like this 500 times. And I have the things here. 2012, there were 26 tear gassings. In 2013, 27. Uh, it, it goes all up to this year, 2018, 29. So President Trump is only continuing a President Obama policy. Now, yes, that is what about ism. But in this case, it's acceptable because we need to shed light that this isn't a new policy. This is The Border Patrol is just enforcing the laws that have been on the books for an awful long time. Okay, uh, so what else should we know? Well, let's talk about the uh, families. Uh, see, a lot of the times these families, they're being called families, and this was what happened when they separated children from their quote-unquote parents, was the problem is often we have human traffickers that are taking these children as slaves or they've been hired to put them through the border and the kids end up being slaves anyways. Um, just terrible, terrible abuse. Anyhow, so they found in the last year 170 family units had to be torn apart because they could not identify the parentage. They, uh, Homeland Security uh, believed that these people were posing as parents to these children, and they just were not. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, what do you think about that? You know, over eight, was it eight percent of women that cross the border illegally uh, face sexual assault and rape? Uh, look up if you have time. Google. Texas rape trees or uh, illegal immigration rape trees and it's these trees just covered in women's underwear and every time a woman gets raped when they're bringing uh, across the border down south by the coyotes uh, they get sexually assaulted and raped they often have to traffic drugs uh, it's a gigantic mess it's just it's just an immoral mess all over the place um, so what else should we know? Mm, I don't know. Uh, let's talk about the uh, photo of the uh, girl. Uh, oh, well, yeah, let's do the photo of the girl next. Well, the photo and the viral photo that went everywhere. NBC found, 
Buzz, sorry, BuzzFeed founder. I'm just going to read a few of it. Uh, <clears throat> she said, I was with them at the wall. I felt scared and wanted to cry. That's when I grabbed my daughters and ran. I thought my kids were going to die of me because of the gas we inhaled. We started running and we fell in the mud. But when I wanted to rise up and get up, I couldn't. Another guy grabbed me by the hand to help me get up. They know we are human beings just like them. It wasn't right they acted this way with the kids. They have kids too and they should have thought about their own kids just like I should have thought about ours. Wait, what? She says, just like they should have thought about ours. She's saying there that uh, <clears throat> it wasn't right what they did to throw tear gas. I'm praying to God. I know that he will open the door so we can enter. Or this is where I, this is what all of you should know. This well, I'm giving the props to this woman for a little bit of honesty. Or if we stay in Tijuana, he'll open the door so that we will be able, they will be able to give us maybe some sort of paper so we can stay and work here. Like I told you, I'm a mother who needs a job. I work to help my kids move forward and give them the best. Isn't that interesting? Well... She was honest at the end part, but she wasn't honest in the first part because we have photos <clears throat> that actually show, and this has gone semi-viral, that shows the camera crews in the back. And that there are other people, they're being put into position for these photos. Uh, you notice the kids are barely wearing pants. Um, the, these are set up photos, okay? I'm not saying her in particular was completely dishonest, but there were dishonest photo ops being tried. This is also seen at the Palestinian-Israeli border in eastern Jerusalem, this in uh, the Gaza Strip. Same exact thing happens all the time where they pose these little kids, these women, children, the disabled, the old, into these photos and they, you know, they often set up so that it looks like they're the evil Israeli guardians over them or there's bombs coming when, you know, it's all just a gigantic setup. You know, it's like pornography or Hollywood. It's not real. Um, I'm sorry, guys. That's just the truth. I, you can't get around it. I, the truth is the truth. I'm not trying to point sides. Yes, you heard me, so I probably side more with President Trump. I think... Congress needs to uh, open up immigration, make the process possible, and make sure that we have people coming legally. I also want a border wall because Congress just does not have a good history of keeping their pledges. Um, and so in that sense, I agree with President Trump. Uh, one last thing. So Kirsten Nelson got tired of all the lies that are being pushed in the media, on the social medias. Uh, people, I've, you know, saying how evil Trump is, you know, if, if you see this picture of women and children being bombed, how can you defend that monster? Well, there is a lot more nuance and a huge, a humongous backstory to the picture. There's a humongous backstory to what's happening. And this is policy, okay? We need to talk not with our feelings, but first with our reasoning. Feelings can be part of it, but reasoning's got to win over the feelings, Okay, it all ha ha feelings have to be tempered in debate so that we can think with facts and think with our noggins. So here's a little bit. It's a five-part thing. She covered some of what I just said, uh, that border police have been violently attacked going through two other countries, inclu in, in not including Mexico. Uh, people have been injured. These people are now obeying the laws often. They're walking around. They come in and they're not waving the American flag. They're not saying, God bless America. They're saying, we love Honduras. Okay, and the reason why they're doing it is because this first caravan in particular was organized by the out party in Honduras that lost the recent presidential election. And they organized this caravan and it's organized of a lot of their uh, political people. Okay, that's just a fact. You can't get around it. Uh, so this is a very political thing in an international sense as well as in a domestic sense for Honduras. Uh, another thing you need to know is the majority of these people are not eligible for asylum. The, here's Okay, so there's a thing. International asylum law, I think I mentioned this before, you guys, says that the first country you can get to you're, out of your own country, you're supposed to apply for asylum. There are also uh, special caveats if you want to be uh, uh, apply for asylum. And they just do not match it. They say, historically less than 10% of those who claim asylum from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador are found eligible by a federal judge. 90% are not. Most of these migrants are seeking jobs or to join family who are in the U.S. already. Uh, but they have refused multiple opportunities to seek protection in Mexico or the UNHCR and the UN Refugee Agency. Seeking employment or family re re reunification are not grounds for asylum under our laws or any international obligation. There is no country that does this. They say, oh, you want a job. We have to let you in. There's no country that does this. None. Zero. Zippo. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that Mexico has offered jobs, the fact that there are many in the U.S. that want to offer jobs is uh, amazing. It is amazing. 
I'm not saying it's necessarily good, but it is out of out of a spirit of kindness, a spirit of friendship. Um, what else should you know? She talks about the being predominantly male, and here's the fifth one, and this is important. Uh, we cannot confirm the backgrounds and identities of the care of all caravan members which possess national security and public safety risk to our people. However, at this point, we have confirmed that over 600 are convicted criminals. <laughs> they include individuals known to law enforcement for assault, battery, drug crimes, burglary, child abuse, rape, and more. This is serious. You guys want to let those those criminals in? And that's not that is not hyperbole. Six hundred of them are known to be criminals. Okay, uh, they, we know that. Mexico has backed this up. Um, it's insane. It's insane. This is all just a freaking political stunt. And no one's using their head to think about this. And if you do think about it, well, you get labeled the old homophobe, bigot, racist, you know the list. I, again, you heard my point on immigration. I want legal immigration that is open to whoever actually wants to come in and wants to work, wants to simulate and be part of our society. Okay? That's what I want. I think that's what most Americans want. And the reason why Trump... This is actually a good thing for Trump, and I'm, this is my electoral part speaking of politics, is most Americans and studies and polls shine this over and over that most Americans, including Hispanics, want legal immigration. They're open to having people come in, but they want them to do it legally. That's not a political thing, guys. <laughs> that That's just... Common sense, and that's just, and we're way more open about immigration than most countries, and that's a good thing. We're very, we're a very patient and kind nation. That is a trait we should keep, but not at the expense of reason, not at the expense of safety. You know what's the most unkind thing you do? To rape and kill someone. <laughs> it is not kind to bring in six hundred criminals. They're going to kill and rape your people. That is not kindness. That is not safety or sanity. That is not diverse. Okay, we have to keep this in control. Now, I am excited because it sounds like the U.S. and Mexico is about to sign a deal where these people can wait on the Mexico side of the border for their turn in court. The problem with illegal immigration often is, is that they will come in and they'll get a court date and they never show up. Most never show up to court. Um, they, they just kind of disappear. And so this idea that they'll be on the other side of the border, this does two things. One, it protects us and it helps, keeps them so they'll have to come to court and, you know, they have to show up. And that will help our legal system and will help give us incentive to speed these things up. Uh, it's a good incentive. And the other part is it incentivizes Mexico to actually enforce their southern border and to not just let people through and to not just use the United States as an exit for all their sick and all their poor and all their deranged and their criminals. I mean, that's what Mexico does. It's disgusting. Instead of solving their own social problems, they just export them to us and enjoy the dividends when they send money back to Mexico. The billionaire in Mexico, that you know, the number one richest man in Mexico, made his money from the money that is sent back from the United States into Mexico. The United States is the top income provider for Mexico. That's crazy. Now, the all I shared with you, all everything I shared with you, this whole last 20 minutes are facts. They are facts. When you are talking to your friends and family about immigration, stick to the facts. Stay calm. Be reasonable. Try to show this in a kind light. You know, death is as unkind as you can get. Rape is as unkind as you can get. We are encouraging people to join up with coyotes who will attack and abuse the women and children. That is not a moral thing. So if you want to do immigration, we have to do it legally, we have to do it right, and we have to make sure that the people coming in on both sides, our citizens and the immigrants, are safe. I think that's fair and reasonable, and that is the happy warrior's position. All right, so next we're going to talk about Russia and Ukraine. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind you, if you are interested in doing commercials for the Sioux Empire Podcast Network or my show, please contact us. You can talk, contact my producer, Rob Melly, or you can contact me. Also, if you have ideas for an episode, if you want to be interviewed, and, and I think you're an interesting person, and you may be more interesting than you realize, um, if you have, if you just want to ask a question, you know, Daily Wire people, Andrew Clavin, Ben Shapiro, Michael Knowles, they always answer questions. You know, you want to want to know how I can fix your love life? You tell me. Uh, so my email is Pete P E T E at Happy Warrior dot net. Pete at Happy. 
<coughs> Pete at happy-warrior.net. Twitter is happy warrior P. Um, Facebook is happy warrior Pete. Um, you all those ways to contact me. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and email. Please do so. Uh, I would love to chat with you and be your friend. Um, if you listen to this podcast, please also go to iTunes, sign up, uh, uh, review for us, say nice things. The, you know, the better reviews, the more reviews we have on iTunes, the hot, more likely people will see our podcast when they go to iTunes. Um, and that's just the way the business is. Okay, so should we talk about something funny before we go on? Let's see. Let's talk about uh, this. This is awesome. I love this story. This this one will make you guys laugh. So my funny story to follow this segment, it comes out of the wonderful country of Australia. Australia, which is home to one of my favorite shows, uh, Dr. Blake. That is an amazing show. They need, there's only like two seasons on Netflix, though. We need the other three. Um, so this story comes out of Australia. So there's this old funny rule in Australia that someone discovered, a legislative quirk that goes back to the 1990s. And someone went viral and just made made it go everywhere. Okay, so here I'm going to read it from the NBC article. That's where I found it from. It says, Australian politicians are being peppered with requests for free portraits of Queen Elizabeth II after a long-forgotten piece of parliamentary code was brought to public attention earlier this week. Under this legislative quirk, which has its origins in the 1990 Parliamentary Act, Australian federal lawmakers are able to give away certain pieces of taxpayer-funded nationhood material under a constituents request program. Um, this ability to request nationhood material can also include pictures of the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, flags, and recordings of the national anthem. This all came to light after a publication of Vice uh, Australia, Vice Australia, point out the obscure legislation. It's not known exactly how many portraits have been requested the last few days, though anecdotal evidence indicated that some were being inundated. <laughs> he says, and this is from uh, he was, uh, Tim Watts, member of the par Parliament for the Opposition Labor Party, says, I can say before the story is published, I received zero requests for portraits of Her Majesty. And then in the last 24 hours, I would say I've had about four dozen. I think 99% were made with tongue firmly in cheek. Uh, he's not alone. Another MP from the Central Alliance tweeted she's received 25 requests for portraits in the space of 12 hours. <laughs> I love this. Uh, and he, she added at the end that I wanted the opportunity to respond to tongue-in-cheek inquiries with a bit of nationhood material of my own. <laughs> That is awesome. I love this story. <laughs> just a, just a, you know, uh, another legislator joked that she had been talked about providing a photo of Beyonce and said pictures of the Queen. But uh, the vice wrote, writer who wrote about the materials was not popular in her office because of the number of requests she had received. Uh, and he said that people, another guy who was with the Liberal Party, said that someone was spamming him on Twitter about the portraits, but pointing out it isn't free. Someone's taxes are going to pay for it. <laughs> Oh, and they, they, the people say this is an argument which goes back to the idea of Australia's sovereignty. How much sovereignty do they really have? If you know, you have to you have to give portraits of the Queen. Is Australia really not sovereign? I mean, the Queen can uh, push out the Prime Minister. I mean, the Queen has a surprisingly a, a large amount of power over Australia. It rarely gets used, but she does have it. And you know who who would use that power actually a lot if he was in control? I think Vladimir Putin would. Uh, Mr. Putin, President Putin, dictator Putin for life of the uh, country of Russia, has decided that we should enter World War Three. <laughs> and he, I don't know why he loves world wars. Actually, he just likes power and he wants to take all the land that left uh, the Soviet Union. He wants all those countries to come back because he feels that when uh, Russia became free, Russia dimmed in its power and its station in the world. A lot of Russians feel this way. Uh, so I'm just going to open here. Here's what Nikki Haley said about this whole situation. Again, I love Nikki Haley. Sad she's leaving. Stand united in opposing Russia's attempt to discuss yesterday's serious escalation and in the Kirk Strait under an agenda item entitled Violation of the Borders of the Russian Federation. We strongly support Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders, extending to its territorial waters. We express our deep concern over the incident, which represent a dangerous escalation and violation of international law. We look forward to discussing Russia's provocation under the appropriate agenda item. 
Accordingly, we urge all council members to vote against the adoption of the agenda as proposed by Russia. Thank you. And there was our amazing Nikki Haley, probably the my favorite, and was voted for the 2018 favorite politician of the year uh, in polls. So, what the heck is going on? What do you mean I say a world war? Well, uh, yeah, we're, we're heading that way. It very well could that by the time you hear this that we're in another war. Because Russia decided that we need to be in one. So, what happened? Well, uh, on Monday, the, the Russia decided to attack and capture three Ukrainian boats. They are military boats. And they took the sailors captured. This was on a coast, it was on the Black Sea, on a coast that both the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Crimea that Russia took share. The Ukrainians have the right to, you know, be on their own coast. Russia has, for the last, uh, how long ago was Jordan? Was that, I was, was like, so for probably the last 10 years, I would say, has tried to provoke these countries, particularly Ukraine, but others, into provocation so Russia then has an excuse they can go in and invade and take the land. Um, you know, that's what they did with Georgia. That's what they did with Crimea. Remember, they scooted in Russians to live in Crimea. And then they said, oh, there's all these Russians in Crimea that want to be free and want to be Russian. Well, why, did, why were they there? Well, because Russia put them there. Obama never stood up to these people. And so you know, Crimea got taken over. That's a, that was a big chunk of the Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> remember, Ukraine was starved. Seven million people were starved to death during the Holodomor, which we just had the 85th anniversary of. This is a very tight uh, time in Ukraine. There's an election coming. You never want to provoke on a country during election because then the leaders have an excuse. They have to feel tough and they'll be more violent or they'll be more prone to violence. But whatever. Russia said, eh, let's do it anyways, guys. So now guess what's happening? The Ukrainian president declared martial law. Yeah, Ukraine is now under martial law. Ah! And, and the Ukrainians are scared to pieces. Here's, here's a little bit of factoids that you should know. So, the Ukrainian president claims that before this, Russia was preparing a ground invasion on this country. In Crimea, they built military bases and were building them up with heavy levels of troops. Uh, point two, he has introduced a month-long stick of martial law. Point three, two Ukrainian artillery ships and a tugboat were fired upon by the Russians. Uh, point four, the gunboats and the tug tried to sail from Odessa to Maripol in the Sea of Asphalt. Russia then scrambled two fighter jets and two helicopters of the area, accusing the ships of illegally entering its waters. It did not, by the way. The Ukrainian Navy later said the boats had been hit and they were disabled. Uh, and then, okay, that's what happened. So now what's the response? What do we do? Well, Obama would have caved. Uh, he was a wuss on this issue. He, they, they you know they had a staring contest, and Obama blinked. And I saw that's. I mean, you can't really say anything else to that. And that maybe that's because Republicans are more war. This. I'm so glad President Donald Trump is the guy in charge right now because he's willing to stand up to Russia. The wrong thing would be is to just cave and let Russia get away with this, and just slowly let Russia annex all the, the rest of Ukraine and all these uh, Soviet uh, satellite countries. Uh, that now we, the Trump and the EU and the U and the UK, the UN, we're all kind of at each other's throats. That kind of stopped now, and we've all started to work together. Uh, Germany, France, Britain, the US have all come together and say this cannot happen. The Trump is pushing back on this. Um, I'm scared. I really am scared that we're going to start a world war. It would be easy to say, well, they should just let Russia do what it wants. But we tried that before. Remember back in the day with uh, the Nazis, uh, they said, oh, look at Austria. Look at Austria and Poland. There's all these German-speaking people. You should just let us let's be a united German country. And, of course, the Britain gave in. The West gave in and allowed it to happen. And then did that, that stop aggression? No. <laughs> it only increased it. Uh, that was the wrong thing to do. Um, so we can't just give in. We have to stand up for the Ukraine. We have to stand up for countries like Taiwan. We, you know, I am not someone that says we police the world, but we should protect countries that stand for freedom. And when they need help to stand for freedom, we should be there with them. Um, that's the kind of the world order we built after World War II under the uh, work of President Truman and especially President Eisenhower. 
where is this going to go from here? It's your guess. I don't know what's going to be done. Russia decided to show, you know, the people on t Russian TV, you know, gun to their <laughs> gun to their head kind of scenario, kind of like what the terrorists like to do. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's it's a mess. I mean, Russia even buzzed past the uh, UK. So the UK, the Russia sent 17 fighter jets just, you know, like skimming past uh, UK boats. I mean, scary, scary stuff. Um, it was last month that when not, uh, NATO and Norway were uh, doing practice drills, uh, Russia blocked and stopped GPS completely. The NATO allies could not use GPS. Russia is trying to provoke a response, and it is idiotic, it is dangerous, it is catastrophic. We do not want this. I, ugh, I and that's why I'm I'm being so big on this part. It is an important news story. It is more important than the immigrants. It's more important than some of my other stories I'm going to talk about. But it's a little hard to understand. Uh, I understand it's a little confusing, but it is important. Um, this could, you know, I hope this is just like a breeze. It's like the Cuban Missile Crisis, and just kind of it's a blip. But everything calms down. Who knows? I'm telling you guys. Pray, pray, pray. If you are a faith member of, um, uh, sorry, if you're a person of faith, please pray for the Ukraine, pray for NATO, pray for President Trump, pray for the Russians, pray that this will all calm down. <sighs> scary, scary stuff. <sighs> okay, so let's move on to more funny stuff. So among all the rush to make every children's character's properties into a movie, uh, the rush, you know, we have Sonic, we have Pikachu, we have Mario, we have everybody. Everyone's given a freaking live action movie. Well, you know, General Mills. <laughs> General Mills like, no, don't leave us out of this. Don't leave us out of this. By the way, the Pokemon movie trailer looks amazing. I really want to see that. I really want to see that. I like Detective Pikachu, by the way, it's very fun. The game, um, and the, the little, it's it's a good game, by the way. If you guys can play it, play it. Um, so General Mills wants to get on in the action. Uh, <laughs> they're saying they want to make movies on the properties of the characters, specifically Count Chocula, Boo Berry, and Frankenberry. <coughs> now, uh, I I love Count Chocula. Love that cereal. I, we need to buy some. I need some right now. In my belly, in my mouth. Uh, Boo Berry, not that great. Frankenberry, not that great. Boo Berry and Frankenberry, by the way, are like the same thing. <laughs> uh, the, at least that's how they taste to me. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna, totally going to get blockbusters. We're going to get blockbusters about Count Chocula, you know, about his backstory. He had a hard childhood. He's, he's an outcast among the uh, vampires. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This is going to be... Awesome. I, I think this is going to be great. Oh. So, hey, if you're listening and you want to donate cereal, contact me at my uh, <laughs> my email or Twitter or Facebook. So, like, hey, you want some food? I'll, I'll buy you some food, Peter. That'd be awesome. That'd be so awesome. Or maybe you should go to our Patreon. Pay, and, and then when you pay uh, the Patreon, you just leave a little message to say, For Pete's Cereal. <laughs> okay, so another fun thing is this going around the internet is this argument that Tolkien's writings are racist. And this is just the most uh, vapid, uh, shallow uh, look at the world of to Tolkien. I would say Tolkien. Tolkien, uh, I've, I've seen yet. Now, I'm a huge Tolkien fan. Huge fan. Uh, I don't quite understand the Sumerian. I've read it and some of the other weird short stories. I love Tolkien. Um, it's a huge part of my family. When we went to the movies in the early 2000s, it was a big event. Going to Fellowship of the Ring was like was like a family reunion. It was like that level event for my family. We love Tolkien. We love him. We love him. We love him. He's a genius in our eyes. There's probably no author, uh, more moral author that wasn't writing religious writings that's above him. So this is basically they're saying that this is all all uh, <clears throat> uh, racist, and they this guy wrote a basically a fan fiction called Senator Bilbo, because uh, he shares a name of an actual racist segregation center with the name of Bilbo Baggins. Uh, his name was Theodore Bilbo. Anyhow, it's this parody where Bilbo is a racist, and it's it's awful. Um, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. They're saying that, of course, it's the orcs. They say, look at the orcs and look how the elves and the dwarfs look at each other. But that's not where he was going with that at all. Tolkien was a famous for his uh, anti-racism. He was, uh, I'm going to use their term, very progressive for his age. 
Okay, Tolkien was making good points, big points about good and evil. It was, it was, you know, you talk about corruption, you know, because the orcs are corruptions of the elves. They're a corruption of that which used to be good is now evil. Um, he wrote this on his experiences from the world wars. He, he his understanding of what was happening, you know, uh, Sauron and the orcs and stuff, all that came from the looking at the Axis versus the Allies. His experiences of the world wars and, and reading about them and living in that time uh, led to him writing Tolkien. You know, he put 20 years world building before he ever wrote the hobbit um he was he's just a genius he's a genius of world building he's a genius of narrative he's a genius of storytelling about good versus evil you know in my own church we've had the guy at the top uh, the president of the church with the prophet has even come out and said that you know tolkien was inspired and these are great stories you know he, he it's awesome i can't say enough good things about tolkien uh, if you have kids and they have not read tolkien do so also there was an amazing it was it's in the late 1970s uh, early 80s, I can't think of it. Anyhow, it was a radio adaptation by the BBC, and that is incredible. So if they have a hard time getting into the book, use the audio drama first and then the book. Maybe the movies, but the movies might push them away because there's a lot more um, in-depth philosophical discussions. There are a lot more characterizations. The, the, you know, the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit are also survival, survivor novels, and the movies don't show that all that well. I like the movies. I like the movies probably more than I should, <laughs> especially the Hobbit movies. I like them, uh, but I know a lot of people don't. Okay, so one weird, one more weird article. I don't quite know what to make of it. I wish I could get my friend. He's uh, a president of a biotech company, um, and he's a really cool dude. He has made glow in the dark cows. He's working on a project right now. Some of which you know the FDA is approving, which is awesome. Um, anyhow. I'm not going to name him unless I get permission. So, but I'm going to ask him about this. See if we can get on the show. That'd be pretty cool. Here's the article. Chinese scientists are creating CRISPR babies. A Chinese scientist came out and said they already made one. And the goal was they're using uh, the DNA of the goal was to make it immune to HIV. Well, only sort of. So this raised huge ethical quandaries. One, it's illegal in most countries. So they did it in China, of course. Two, it's using CRISPR to do it. And we don't quite know what the total outcomes of organisms, specifically humans, are on the long term due to CRISPR. Um, three, this actually made the kid more likely to get sick because it didn't give him the full genes for the HIV, just gave him half the genes to prevent HIV. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not full prevention even if you have them, but it also makes you way susceptible to flu and malaria and other diseases. This is hugely unethical. Of course China has done it. I imagine China has much more unethical reasons. I mean, this is the country that captures political dissidents and harvests them for organs to sell on the black market. I mean, this is the country that watches Black Mirror and thinks that's a guide to running a country. <laughs> I'm seriously. I'm, I'm not the only one that's made that point, but I think it's so f it's funny in a terrible, terrible, awful way. I mean, they're heading towards this mix of 1984 and Brave New World, and Google is helping them, but we're not going to talk about Google this time. We've talked about the Silicon Valleys in the past. We'll talk about today about Twitter in a little bit. Um, so where should we go from here? We, should we do Twitter, Amazon, Doctor Who? Mm, I'm going to do Doctor Who. So let's move to Doctor Who. Uh, here's my Doctor Who impression, okay? There you go. There you go. The musical stylings of Peter Pischke. <laughs> now I can't get in trouble with the BBC for doing that, right? That was a cover. That's fair use. Um, so I'm going to talk about Doctor Who, specifically the horrendous season 11, which is just as awful as I predicted, um, sadly. I, and I'm sad. This, you know, I'm kind of gleeful in the sense that I was right, but it, you know, I told you so doesn't make things better. It's just a little bit of, you know, self-arrogance. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's tanking. Um, it's, it's pretty bad. So how do, where should we start? Well... First off, I want to start that the reason why it's tanking is nothing to do with the fact that the new Doctor is a woman. In fact, that's one of the last features, I would say, is the reason it's tanking. 
Um, it's taking because it's boring. It's taking because it's too loaded, and it's taking because the scripts are way too regulated in PC, and it's PC to the max. Here's a couple of the stories that they've done so far. We're on story eight, by the way, and there are only two left, and people are saying they're just downright boring. So this week we had the witch finders where the the doctor is a woman and so she gets accused of being a witch and she has to wear the right clothes and has to hide and it's really stupid. And we don't even learn until like the last five minutes of the show that's an alien. It's like this ugly mud creature. It's really stupid. Not, it's not very well made. Um, it's not even connected to history. So, you know, there's this idea that witches are only women, and that is just a humongous falsehood. Yes, there was more women, you know, just like the caravan was more men. Well, it was more women, but there are plenty of men that got accused of witchcraft. Um, and by the way, witchcraft, we always talk about the Salem one in the United States, but that was so small compared to the tens of thousands that were killed in Europe. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, actually, there was a good percentage of the people that were killed as witches were men. I, it's just the truth. It's just the truth. It's a fact. You know, facts don't care about your feelings. That's a Ben Shapiro quote. Um, Alan Cumming was good in that episode, by the way. But I mean, it was just ridiculous. It was ridiculous. And there were articles that came out saying, this is the, this is an episode that only the 13th Doctor could do. This is the only thing the 13th Doctor could do because she's a woman. Oh, oh, oh. It's just ridiculous. It's, it's so, so, so stupid. Uh, oh, and here, here it is. I was looking for it. It says, the witch hunt specifically targeted women. And this is from Kingsley uh, College in Britain. It says, though most recorded history of civilizations last hundreds of years, women have been subordinate to men. Many witch finders held that women were far more susceptible to temptation. So witch hunts did almost exclusively target women, sometimes as high as 95%. Another interesting point is that, uh, you know, the people in charge were mostly men. However, there were men that were accused and executed for it. That's kind of where we get the idea of the name Warlock. And in Russia, in particular, the majority of the victims were men. <laughs> okay, again, facts don't care about your feelings. There were men killed. Uh, it, it, it's just silly. Some of the stuff that they write here is just utter crud. Uh, th this is from uh, io9. I read that part of the Gawker Gizmodo family. It says, This season of Doctor Who is one of the new takes on familiar themes, pushing the boundaries of what the show can do, sometimes pulling it back to its earliest roots, sometimes just frustrating proof it's still Doctor Who. But this week, in Among the High Camp and the Mud Witches, is a story only this era of the show could sh show. And it's just ridiculous. Uh, and of course, they say, oh, this is just like today. It's everything that the women face. It was just a garbage episode. <laughs> it just was garbage. And actually, sad, I'm sad to say, even though it was a garbage episode, it was better than a lot of the previous ones. Just ridiculous. The episode before this was Kerblam, which was just, it was basically Doctor Who versus Amazon. Um, if... <laughs> <laughs> now look, I'm not defending Amazon. I will talk about Amazon after this segment with Doctor Who. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was Amazon, okay? It was Amazon. Amazon is evil. And I agree, Amazon is for good and for bad. You know, it's it's not just one or the other. It's just not very well. Episode before this was Demons of Punjab. Uh, and this was, and there are so many of these this season. It was uh, historical and it was about the evil, you know, white people pushing down on the poor, you know, minority race. Uh, now, it was an interesting setting in the sense that this is when Pakistan and India split. That is an interesting setting. I want a story like that. The bad guys of the story were pretty interesting. They were called the assass They were race assassins, and I think they're called, what, Tijarian? That, that was pretty cool. There were cool things about, but overall it was kind of a boring episode. Before that was Arachnids in the UK, which has been... Cat it was basically Doctor Who versus Trump. It was this Trump stand-in, this evil hotel year from America that wants to run for president one day. Just garbage. And before that was uh, Rosa. This is the one... You know, they didn't go, by the way, to the UK's past with, uh, with uh, evil race relations. They just decided to go to the US because it's so much easier to make fun of uh, another country. It's easy to make fun of the US. Okay? They, they didn't have the balls to go and make fun of their own times. Uh, or, you know, I, I just... That frustrates me. Besides that, it was basically this. Evil white supremacist from the future wants to come back and prevent Rosa Jones because... Somehow doing that stops 
the civil rights movement? I would say no, because Rosa Parks was uh, not the first person. They had tried several different women. Um, I forget the name of the woman that first tried to, you know, stay in the front of the bus, but she wasn't good looking. She wasn't as interesting, so it didn't catch. But with Rosa Parks, it did. Um, and so I think even if Rosa Parks hadn't done it, that some woman in her stead probably would. Uh, but that's just me. I'm not saying that Rosa Parks wasn't brave. I'm just saying there's more to it than that. Ghost Monument was kind of interesting. It was the most Doctor Who episode of them so far. And before that was The Woman Who Fell to Earth. This is the one that had millions of viewers come in. And I will say it was interesting. I, I, I watched it for the same reason that they did. Because, you know, it's a new Doctor. It's a woman. It's all kind of, you know, we want to see it. It's interesting. It wasn't great, but it was maybe the best of them so far. These are, the problem with all these, besides being super PEC and SJWE, I mean, the characters never push back. There's never another uh, theory pushed on our philosophy about what's going on. They, they, the, the characters are always apologizing, particularly Bradley Walsh, who is an amazing actor, uh, always complaining about what the evil white people are doing. And I know that sounds racist. I know it sounds like I'm alt-right right now. I am not. That is what is happening in the episodes. Um... This is not doing well, by the way. It is not helping the show. People must say, well, it's just wonderful. The show's doing so well. That is not true. Unfortunately, actually, the show is going through a hard thing. Um, they say that this next season might not even happen 2019. If it does, it's going to be half season. Uh, Chibnall, who is the showrunner, is saying he might leave. And then Jody Whittaker is coming in saying, well, if he leaves, I'm leaving too. <laughs> <laughs> There's not going to be a Christmas special this year. Instead, they're going to do a New Year's Eve special because they ran out of ideas for Christmas. That's, that is junk. That is junk. You ran out of ideas for Christmas? Really? Really? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, well, Big Finish is coming out with Christmas stories every year. A uh, Big Finish, by the way, is the superior Doctor Who. After the day, after David Tent leaves, go to Big Finish because it's superior. It's the better Doctor Who. I know it's audio dramas and some people don't have the intelligence to enjoy them, but hey, whatever. Uh, it's sad. So Chris Chimnall may be leaving. So what is this about ratings? Some people are saying, oh, that's a lie. The ratings are lowering. This is a half-truth. Okay, so what do I mean by half-truth? Well, I like this. It's okay. What do I mean by half-truth? Well, um... <clears throat> Sorry, I had to clear my voice. The initial episode did well. The initial episode had about 8.2 million turn in to watch. But since that episode, the numbers have been dro dropping. And the, other, the people that defend a doc this Doctor Who, not because maybe they even love the show, but because they, it's the right thing to do. It's the PC thing to do. Um, we're good progressives, and that's what we do. Uh, they say, oh, well, you know, we're just in a new age. People don't watch TV the same way, you know, and look, it's better than Capaldi's, but Capaldi's lower ratings, and I love Peter Capaldi's uh, por portray portrayal of the Doctor, uh, was low, and that's why they kicked P Peter Capaldi off earlier than they should have. Um, and so, yeah, that was lower, but you're supposed to be higher. You're supposed to be making the BBC a profit. The BBC wants this to be a mega franchise as big as Star Wars, Star Trek. And it is big. Um, but it's not going to get big if you're killing your audience. And what I mean is killing your audience is the, the, the BBC and even members of the production team have gone out of their way to make fun of those who have a problem with switching the Doctor to a woman. They have a problem with the show always being about PC, never having another philosophy. You know, Doctor Who, the reason why I love Doctor Who is because I love science fiction. But the problem with science fiction is often it's there's a lot of adult, there's a lot of drugs, a lot of sex. I don't want to be reading uh, sexual situations in every sci-fi book. You know, I like Heinlein, but, you know, again, <laughs> I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm a, uh, a good Christian and someone that wants to be moral. I try to leave pornography alone in all its forms. That is a little weird, a little extreme. I understand if that's not how you think, you know, each to their own, but that's how it is for me. Well, they even had uh, the doctor, Julie Whitaker, come out and say that the, the old doctors is just the, the old, what was it, the white men's gaze. That this is a new view of it. It's no longer the white men's gaze. 
that's not what the doctor has been about. The doctor is about, you know, he's very forward thinking, he's very kind, he's very loving. The doctor has never been a racist, the doctor has never been a sexist or a bigot. The doctor is always encouraging us to be our best selves, and he does not divide people based on their race because he is an alien. So all races are alien to him. They're all different. He is not a white supremacist. I, this idea that he was that uh, got pushed in the final Capaldi episode by Stephen Moffat is absurd. The first Doctor was never like that. There are two episodes we can point to that maybe were racist, but it was the feelings of the time. And it wasn't an active racism, it was more a passive racism. I'm not just defying it, but to say the Doctor is a bigot and we needed a woman to fix his atrocities is just silly. Silly. Silly stuff. Silly, silly stuff. Um... <clears throat> So, what's going to happen, I don't know. You know, if Jodie Whittaker leaves, that could really hurt the show, and it would hurt the PR because they'd be saying, hey, you know, now they couldn't have a woman. Doctor Who viewers are sexist, and, the, you know, the show might crash. They might try to have another doctor, and they won't do well. I don't know. I want this to turn around. If they pull it out in these last two episodes out of the fire, and the next season or half season Doctor Who is good and people like it and it does well then hopefully this can turn around i want the doctor who franchise to live on i love it like a baby i really do <laughs> it's taken the place where star wars used to be in my heart um i i want it to improve i really do i am rooting for you jody i'm rooting for you chris chimnall neil gaiman came out and says you know, guys, he said this. It's kind of like a signal to everyone about what's really going on. He says, my friend Toby Whitehouse, he's a writer for Doctor Who stories, including Big Finish. And he says, so I worked with him on a script. Um, and, you know, he showed me a script before he sent it to the BBC. And he showed me the script after. He says the thing was basically an abomination. Or he, that wasn't, he didn't use the strongest language, but he says this thing was completely different. And that is, I've read it a lot of places and with uh, pretty good evidence, that basically the reason why this season is so boring and why the stories at the end of the Capaldi area were so, I don't know, they were just so all the time, you know, Bill was saying, I'm, I'm a lesbian, you know, need that you forget, you know, in the last five, ten minutes, I have to remind you again. <laughs> uh, it's just ridiculous. And they said the BBC is doing this. You know, that's the difference between the U.S. and BBC media. Both have to go to talk to someone. But the, in the U.S., we talk to our corporate overlords, the producers and the people that finance the show. Um, and they make decisions on thinking if it will sell or not, if it will survive, not survive, but if it will flourish as a product in the free market. In the BBC, that is not the system. They sort of keep that in mind, but the regulators are more interested in putting out the right message and the right view and more about the politics. And what happens is they go through these scripts and they just murder them in their sleep. And they change them and shake them up and they make them awful and not to resemble the original interesting story. Okay, we don't need to be told every five minutes about how awful white people have been or are, or how awful Trump is, or on and on and on. You know, Doctor Who was, sh was not a show about about politics okay political issues showed up but he never he rarely came on one side of a political issue or another and even if he did you know there's usually another character that had a different view that could just as be as right and it was up to the viewer to decide which of these philosophies is right is the doctor right is the doctor wrong you know there's an episode about doctor who with guns and you know he says never again you know that's a famous um uh david Tennant era line and there are other people that show, you know, maybe military training is necessary. You know, maybe it's okay to defend yourself. And there's all kinds of philosophies going on. And yeah, it comes strongly in the gun, but there are alternative messages. And these new episodes, it's not that. It's there's the one message and that is it. Another one last problem I want to point out. They need to get rid of the companion characters or they need to stick to just one companion character. Or if they have the companion characters, they can only have one subplot. Dividing yourself into three plots, a plot and three subplots, does not work. It gives the Doctor no time to care, to show her characterization. Jodie Whittaker so far has not shown herself to be... I mean, she's a good actress, but she hasn't shown to be the unique Doctor yet. She's just doing mimics of previous Doctors. One one episode is the Matt Smith. One episode is Peter Capaldi. One episode is the Christopher Eccleston. But it's not, you know, this is Jodie Whittaker's Doctor. We don't have that feel yet. <clears throat> uh, and I don't, I'm not totally sure why that is, but it could, probably could be put on pawn that there isn't just enough time for her to play. Um, I, I think Bradley Walsh is the best of the three companions. A lot of people, particularly on the left, want to say Yaz. 
Um, I, look, you decide on one, guys, or decide on just keeping it to two plots, and you'll be much better off, I think. Let's hope that this, uh, this works out. Um, better news for Doctor Who is that we're going to get a Tom Baker novel. Tom Baker wrote a uh, script that was going to be for a Doctor Who movie. And he shelved it because, you know, the movie didn't happen. Well, now someone convinced him he's making it into a book. Uh, big finish. If you're listening, make an audio on the book. <laughs> uh, do that book. And also, Big Finish is coming out with a Rose solo series. Rose, the the first companion of New Who. Uh, probably the favorite companion of New Who next to Donna. Um, she's going to get a solo series. It's going to take place in Pete's world during the time where she was, you know, between where she got caught in the world and she met the Doctor again. It's going to feature her. It's going to feature the actress who played her mom and the actor who played her dad. And it's looking great. I really want to listen to that. I'm excited to listen to that. Um, okay, so before, let's talk a little bit more about Britain. So, Britain is having a bit of, uh, a bit of a problem right now. Uh, they seem to, uh, not seem to get their schools in order. I don't know what the fetch is going on with you guys, but it seems to me with this and everything else I've read, I've read, that, uh, Britain is trying to burn itself down to the ground. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know that is. I'll, I don't know how else you guys are going to put it. Okay, so let's do this story. This is a funny story. Funny in a sad way. I want answers. This is from The, the Sun. Parents at school where 30-year-old asylum seekers studying for the GCSEs are keeping their children at home. A growing number of parents have withdrawn their kids from the Stoke High School in Ipswich, Suffolk, after the... Sorry, I have a lot of... Uh, indigestion day. Uh, after the investigation to the year 11 pupil was launched... So here's the story. There's a picture of it. It's a guy with a beard. He looks older than I do. <laughs> I'm 29. He was set, he said he was there at 15. He is an uh, immigrant from Iran. And he and his brother, his brother was apparently acting as a 12-year-old, neither of which are that. I think they're both in their 20s. Uh, he's 30. Sorry. He's 30. The other guy's in his 20s. Uh, and the people were pointing it out, and the school was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not listening. No, 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 no. You know? <laughs> They're like, look, guys, that guy is 30. That guy is 30. I mean, he leers at women when he's at school. He tries to look at the girls during his break. I mean, it's disturbing stuff. Uh, it's, it's really, it's kind of funny, too. It's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It is so funny. Uh, I Yeah, that, that guy is 30. He's an adult. What are you doing over there, Britain? <laughs> oh, I, I'm 15, I swear. Uh, 15. <laughs> you have a very prominent apples, Adam, sir. I'm, I'm, fifth, I'm, uh, I'm advanced for my age. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And this is not just in one school. This is... So why they do it is they are offered a free education, and so these people that didn't have an education when they were, in, you know, from the Middle East or Africa, they come in and they want an education, so they, sh you know, they fake being kids, and there are pictures and videos of these people with these buses full of these men who are in their twenties coming out and going to these high schools, and they're hoping that from there they can go to college, and they're doing it because they want a free education, but it is putting children in danger. It it's, it is dangerous. Um, uh, British children have a high rate at the moment of the chance of being uh, groomed for sexual abuse. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a connection between these two things, but I have no evidence, okay? That's probably just a correlation. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, he says, here's another thing. He claimed the pupil, the 30-year-old, bombarded a 15-year-old girl, classmate with text messages, prompting her to complain the safe guarding staff because she was worried about his true age. They said uh, uh, these people, the teacher would ask this, the teacher of the kid would ask this says, well people mature at different ages. Yes they do. <laughs> Apparently yeah, yes they do because this 30 year old thinks he's a 15 year old. It's just freaking ridiculous. Um what else is wrong with Britain? Well, this isn't a Britain so much, but it's in Europe. A poll shows that anti-Semitism in Europe is growing and that a larger and larger number of people just don't know about their history of the Holocaust in the early and uh, middle 20th century. And they said they interviewed 7,000 people across Europe from Austria, France, Germany, Great Britain, Hungary, Poland, and Sweden. 
Um, so they had a thousand from each country. They said about uh, one in twenty uh, across the board said they didn't know anything about it. In France, one out of every five people from age eighteen to thirty-four said they never heard of the Holocaust. Never heard of the Holocaust. A third of the Europeans interviewed said that the Jews used the Holocaust to advance their own positions or goals. And that's uh, anti-Semitism. That's classic anti-Semitism. It has a lot to do with anti-Zionism. And you can't really separate the two, by the way. People want to try, but I don't believe you can. Um, it's just hatred for Jews. And they're not learning their history. And this is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. You should never forget the Holocaust. You should never forget the evils of fascism and the Nazi regime for so many reasons. You know, for eugenics. You know, that's why I'm against abortion, euthanasia, because of the history of that and what they did to people like me, you know, the useless eaters, is barbaric. Barbaric. You know, we have now in Canada and England that children could be euthanized. I think it's in Canada where they don't even need to tell the parents. I don't know how you get around that because, like, what happened to Jimmy? <laughs> It's not even like hide the abortion from the parents. It's how do you hide, you know, killing the kid? I don't know how you do that. Uh, I could be wrong. It's one of those two countries. Um, scary stuff. I am totally against it. But one in 20 and one in five and one third, those are big numbers. Those are very, you know, one in 20 is a statistically significant number. That's 5%. Uh, dangerous stuff. I, you know, I love Britain because I love Doctor Who and I have... I have ancestry from Western Europe mostly, and some in uh, in you know Nordic countries, but mo and a big chunk from Germany. You know, my last name is Pischke. That's that's a Prussian. That's a German name. Um, it means Peter, by the way. So I'm Peter von Peter. That's my <laughs> in English. That's my full name, Peter von Peter. I like to go by now Happy Warrior Pete when I'm with you guys. I think that's. That's a cool thing to do. So let's go back to, here's an interesting thing. Do you guys remember this story I told you back during the summer about this um, scholar that put out a paper? And her theory was academically that uh, on, rapid onset gender dysphoria could happen and it was partially due to social factors. Her thing was, I look at these kids and it's show up in these classes, these schools or these classes, you have a large number of trans kids. One ki trans kid shows up and it catches fire and, mo and more want to do it. It's still a small amount, but it's, it's, it's a big enough correlation. You don't need a lot to make something statistically significant. That last thing had one in five, that, you know, sorry, one in 20, that is 5%, that is a statistically significant number. Um, of course, the, there was a huge outroar about this. They tried to delete the paper from memory and to even refer to it. Uh, I had to find it. It took me a while to find it. Um, <clears throat> No, that, I'm not just kidding. It was just one Google click. I take, <laughs> I take that back. I was exaggerating a little bit there. I could keep this honest. Um, but that's because I am a, a, an expert Googler. I'm, I'm, I'm the top. I'm one of the top Googlers. You know, I have a master's in journalism, and a huge part of that was research. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty decent at research. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, like, the very best, but I think I'm pretty good. I would put myself up there. Uh, maybe that's just my pride talking. <laughs> okay, so the, here is a story of the Daily Mail. I found this through the American Spectator originally, but 17 students in a British school, many of them autistic, uh, are, are becoming transgender. And this is the teacher is the one that came out and said she's worried about that. She said that these kids, she thinks mostly are, she, her experience with them is that they're mostly special needs kids. They're autistic. There was this, just this one kid and then they all kind of followed. Um, <clears throat> uh, conservative MP David Davies say, I congratulate this teacher for coming out and telling us what I've long suspected has been going on in our schools. It is horrendous that children are being encouraged by other pupils to identify as transgender, particularly if they have autism. Look, if you are if you have autism, you're not sure what to do with yourself, you're not sure how to, these feelings, and you're very confused. Everyone's very confused with their feelings, but especially when you have some disorder like autism. And you see transgender, you're like, that must be what's wrong with me. I was listening to an interview about, with uh, sex scientist Deborah So. By the way, Deborah So, if you're listening, uh, marry me. I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I thought she was awesome. I learned so much from her. She's such a cool person. Um, Deborah So talked about that, you know, a lot of these people that are trans when they're kids, actually what they're having is, you know, the beginning feelings of, you know, uh, homosexuality and that a lot of these people, are, when they become adults, become uh, homosexuals or identify as such. 
And her point was, where f these people have these feelings, they maybe they have more female traits, the male traits that they're man, you know, uh, vice versa that they're women, and they just don't know how to deal with these feelings as they gravitate towards the trans ideology. But the trans ideology does not bring solace. Statistic after statistic after statistic, I've shared this statistic before in previous outlines, that show that suicide rates do not go down after these sex change surgeries and hormones are used. In fact, they often go up. Uh, dangerous stuff. Uh, and, and in the fact, with men, you know, the chemicals, the estrogen is a uh, cancerous chemical to men, the artificial estrogen. It causes tumors. It's, and, you know, it's transgenderism. Look, I want you should be kind to everyone. You know, this is right. You see, that's a song from my church. Uh, always remember this kindness begins with me. But you have to stick to reality. Is uh, using a fake uh, identification, reality, is that kind? Because it's. I think that's more about convenience. I think often when we want to deal with the trans, it's less about kindness and it's more about convenience. We just don't want to float the boat, whatever, let them believe what they want to believe. And I'm all about li live and let live, okay? Uh, that's the libertarian part of me. We can go that way. But to say that we have to put a subjective view over our objective view, you know, the emperor is wearing no clothes, okay? We all say he's be as beautiful clothes, but come on, that's not reality. That doesn't help these people. The suicide goes up. People who have trans often have huge levels of depression, um, have huge levels of bipolarism. These are people that need help. And by by encouraging this, does not heal that void. And what's scary to me is often we're pushing kids, six, eight. There's a story of this dad in Texas. The kid, uh, the mom wants to take away parental rights for the dad because the kid, when it's with the mom, identifies as a female. She wants him to get the surgery. She wants him to take the chemicals, which will sterilize him. Now, the kid, they said, when he's with the dad alone, wants to be a boy. So the kid is just, you know, gravitating to whatever will make the parent happy. Um, scary stuff. This idea that we give chemicals to kids and we mutilate them and we sterilize them is disgusting to me. It is disgusting. It is child abuse. It is abhorrent. I think the parents that engage in this and the people that engage in this will have to answer to God in the next life for doing this atrocity. Um, I was listening to a guy, I want to say his last name is Welt, and he was a guy that transitioned. He's a man, but he transitioned to a female, and he talks, and he came back, and he says, you know, how it devastated his life and how he so regrets doing it. He says that people that have these feelings, they need help. And it's not, giving in delusions doesn't help them. You know, we want to pretend that we have magical uh, science powers and we can just change men into women and women into men. Poof. We cannot. We cannot change the chromosomes. The uh, surgeries that where we give a man breasts, you know, those, are, those aren't real. Okay? <laughs> um, when, we, when we change a uh, I'm sorry, this is going to use some medical language, so if you don't want your kids to hear it, maybe turn this down. You, they try to change a penis into a vagina, they fillet it, and they have to leave it as an open wound forever. You always have to work at it, or the body will try to heal it and cover it up. It's not a working vagina, okay? And not a working uh, penis for the woman. It's not working. We don't have the powers to change them. In the future, maybe. I don't know if that, when we have artificial bodies and we can do that for people, Okay, great. But at the moment, we cannot change them from man to woman and woman to man. It's, it's impossible at the moment. I, I know that's hard. I know that's hard. I know it's a touchy subject. I know we want to be kind to good people. You know, America is partial. One of the things that make America so great is America is kind. America is kind in a good way. We're good people. We want to do good. We want to be good. We want to take care of others. We want to be the shining beacon on the hill to all the world. And that is great. That is awesome. But you have to stick to facts on this. Uh, it's so easy to just give in. Okay, I'm, I'm okay. If they want to change their name, fine. Because you can change your name. Anyone can be named anything. Some names used to be more masculine. You know, Ashley used to be a man's name. So, you know, fine. But this idea that you use certain pronouns is is idiotic do not do it do not give in to that part but you can if you want you know recognize their new name if you're if now here's some caveats if you're a family member and the only way you can keep a relationship is someone to feed in the delusion that's up to you you have to i want you to pray about it i want you to think about it and you have to make that call for yourself but in general in open society no no, do not do that. You can you can call them by the new name, fine, but don't don't think that you can just buy into the he is now a she and she is now a he and how dare you for not saying that. Uh, Canada just has been invoking legislation that would make it illegal to say the wrong pronoun. Um, 
just insane. Dangerous, dangerous insanity because it's not reality, guys. We're feeding into to, to, to delusions. Well, why do I, I bring this all up? Because um, it's become a new issue again because of Twitter. See, Twitter decided that it's going to, so I talked about in the summer that Twitter has these policies that they don't really tell you what they are. The, the terms of service, their agreement, terms of agreement are pretty loose. They don't really explain what the fetch is going on. They kind of ban people left and right for wherever the heck they want, when they want, and it's never really explained. Twitter actually, and I guess in a weird way I'm going to give them credit, actually came out and said their terms of service means you can't, call, you cannot, if you want to be on Twitter, you cannot call people by their dead name. Dead name is the old name they used to have. And so now I'm Caitlin, but I used to be Bruce. Okay, that's their dead name. By the way, it's such a cool, someone needs to be a band, or this is Doctor Who villain, the dead name. <laughs> that sounds cool. Uh, and it's it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous change of terms of service. So you can't use, you have to use term pronouns, which by the way, easy mistake to make. I mean, my mom does this to me and my dog all the time. She's like, oh, she or he, and it gets it confused. Totally innocent. My grandma does it too, by the way. It might be by it might be hereditary or something. Um, <coughs> anyways, it's ridiculous. Of course, then guess who they went and they started banning? Well, they were already banning conservatives mostly, but they have banned some feminists. And I'm going to start with, let's do, you want to do this? Okay, we will do. Uh, hold on, sorry. All right, here we go. We will big go to the feminists. So, Wonderful article on the Federalist. Um, Twitter permanently bans feminists for writing that man, men aren't women. All she did was write this thing on Twitter saying that uh, <coughs> men can't be women and that the transgender idea, the movement, harms feminism because men can just say I'm a woman and then take advantage of all the work that men, women have done that puts women in danger. The head of the, the former head of the ACLU, the president of the ACLU, was one that pushed for transgenderism. Until she had one day, she went to a bathroom with her her teen and tween daughters. The, there was two men that came in there that were trans, or the, I guess female trans. And, you know, it made her extremely uncomfortable. And she had a moment of inspiration where she realized what the fetch she was doing. And she quit. And she had this wonderful post, very smart post about, you know, ACLU has gone completely wrong on this issue and this is not fair to women. So there's, there is this strain, legitimate strain in feminism right now that has a problem with transgenderism. Um, the lady that got banned is Megan Murphy. She calls herself, she calls herself an extreme feminist, okay? She is a leftist uh, through and through. <laughs> okay, she's also a pro-socialist. Um, it's just, just ridiculous, ridiculous. She and she got suspended permanently, permanently, and she's not giving in totally. So another person, Laura Loomer, she is. They call her. She's alt right sort of. Um, she she technically, I guess, is a journalist, but she's more like the Sean Hannity kind of journalist, where. Uh, you know, you're very provocative and you're very for one side over the other. Not the happy warrior way, okay? That's not what we do here at Happy Warrior. We try to use facts and reason and try to meet each other, try to build a bridge. That's not Loomer. <laughs> Loomer's not trying to build bridges. <laughs> so, But she got banned for, uh, what was it? I'm trying to say. She said, oh yeah, she said, pointed out that one uh, one particular of the new representatives, uh, Ilyani Omar, has a history of anti-Israel com comments, being for pro-Sharia, she's pro-boycotting Israeli businesses, and she is pro-female mu genital mutilation. These are all extremely important issues. She's going to be in Congress now. Why is it, why is it wrong to point that out? I, I you know it's facts again. Facts don't care about your feelings. These are facts. Twitter. These are facts. I know. You may like those things, fine, but it's facts to say that they exist and that's how well, how she feels on issues, okay? If you, of course, they're afraid, you know, to point it out that anyone on the left might adopt something so evil as female genital mutilation uh, is wrong. So they have to silence them. They have to block them. 
And I know that the Silicon Valley is largely controlled by the political left. And then I'm not trying to hurt the feelings of people who are on the left who might listen. And thank you for taking the time to listen to someone that you might disagree with. I appreciate it. And you're a good American to do so, and a good intellectual. It's on, that's honest intellectualism. Well, Jesse Kelly is a comet vet, conservative writer, radio host. He served in, in Iraq. He's a war hero. He got banned. And we have no idea why. And Twitter has said in their new terms of service that they have to tell you when you violate so you can fix it or why you get permit suspension. They, they did not. <laughs> they left that part empty. <laughs> and they're trying to figure it out. They, some people think maybe he was cussing, but he says, I, I generally don't cuss. So some people think he said something really political. And he's not even totally sure what that is. He is a, he's a little bit of provocative, but not super so... Uh, he's a funny guy. You know what's really funny about this, too? Jesse Kelly wrote back in August after the Alex uh, <clears throat> Jones got banned, and Robert and I talked about how this is a terrible precedent. This is bad because we, need, we want free speech. We don't want to censor speech because, you know, freedom, liberty is always better than censorship and control. Uh, so he wrote a piece on the Federalist saying the left won't stop at Alex Jones. The slippery slope is real, and we're on it. Wow, was he right. <laughs> I, I love this. There's a, there's a great two parts in here. I'm just going to read these. No, it's, this is the ending of it. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> it's only Alex Jones is a comforting blanket. It's the child who closes his eyes and covers his ears in the naive hope that the monster disappears if you can't see or hear him. But the monster does not disappear, and it is most definitely not just Jones. Yesterday it was Jones. Today, YouTube censored human vanilla Dennis Prager. Tomorrow, there may be a knock on your door. Freedom is not something you acquire by practicing it. You don't one day wake up and decide you are free. Freedom is something tangible, and it requires the cooperation of others. If others will not give you that cooperation, you have to take it away from them. We need to stop whistling past the graveyard and realize the left is seeking total victory. They do not want to compete in a marketplace of ideas. Their goal is to silent dissenting voices. There we go. That is fantastic. And that's exactly what happened. They did censor him. They did close him up. Um, it's And now Instaponent is a big conservative one. They have decided to, you know, in protest, close their account. You know, good for them. Um, I want to play this clip. This is uh, Jesse Kelly describing his experience with this and what he has to say. Uh, he's on the Tucker Carlson show. Uh, I don't watch Tucker very often. I like Tucker Carlson overall, but since he's been on Fox, sometimes he's it acts a little bit more like the handies of the world than I would like. Um, but I do like his website, Daily Caller, a lot. He's a he's a cool dude. I used to watch him back when he was on MSNBC in that terribly ugly, hideous studio they had him on back in the day. All right, here we go. Jesse, thanks a lot for coming on. You knew this was coming. You presciently predicted it. Why did Twitter take you off its platform? Nobody knows. Twitter kicked me off the platform because I was a mainstream voice on the right that spoke the truth, Tucker, and, and that's all anybody knows. They've given me no explanation as they told Congress they would give explanations. I, all they sent was an email that said you are permanently banned and you can't appeal it for repeated rules violations only I don't violate their rules. I don't cuss at people on there. I don't harass people on there. I don't do any of those ugly things that some people do. So Twitter's going to become what they are. All of a sudden, my account vanished like a Hillary Clinton email. In fact, once they banish your account, it wasn't a suspension. They completely banished me, so I'm not even able to log in and email Twitter's support. A friend of mine sent me a couple email addresses for people that supposedly work at Twitter. But I'm sure they're not going to answer any of those. It's they just uh, they did exactly what I said they would do. They came for Alex Jones first because he's a nut job and they wanted to see how the right would react. They got him and I knew they were coming for me. They'll come for you, too, because these radical voices on the left never get censored. Even Farrakhan, that complete scumbag that has a tweet still up comparing Jews to termites. He still has an account. But I post things about Velveeta and mine gets banished. Yeah, and that last point that Jesse Kelly was making is completely right. The guy named Louis Farrakhan, he's a monster. He is a huge anti-Semite, a homophobe, every nasty ite you can be, he is. Um, he's uh, the head guy of the Nation of Islam. Uh, he used to be known as Louis X back in the day. Uh, he's a disgusting, disgusting man. Um, 
I, I, I mean, even the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti Defamation League call him an anti Semite and a proponent of anti white theology. Okay, so it's not it's not just us conservatives. I mean, there are people on the left who are like this guy is loony too. He's just bonkers. You know, his tweets about you know calling Jews termites and everything else still up there, still there. They have no problem. They don't uh, censor him at all. And somehow he's okay, but the rest is not. I do not understand it. I do not understand it at all. It's it's bothersome to me, but I know I don't know what 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 will change. I don't know what we can do to fix it. We have to just keep encouraging them to turn back to free speech. Uh, it's frustrating. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening to the program today. Um, here, here's one more thing I'm going to talk about. Yeah, let's talk about Amazon. This is kind of a fun thing to end on. We're going to talk about Amazon. <laughs> Amazon and what they the cities offered to get in. So this, if you don't remember this, Amazon said, we're going to build headquarters somewhere in the nation and we want all you politicians to grovel and offer us the moon. Uh, <laughs> and the politicians did. The politicians did. They did lean over. They kissed the shoes of uh, Amazon. They offered them all the money in the world. New York had to offer them, you know, almost, I think it was like a billion dollars or something to move there. I think I'll just start from the top and uh, move our way down. So this is from BuzzFeed. Props to BuzzFeed for doing this. Uh, Georgia was going to offer $2 billion of taxpayer-funded incentives. They wanted to have an Amazon Georgia Academy State University. They wanted to give them a state university. <laughs> wanted to give them free parking. <laughs> wanted to make addition of a stop on the Atlanta car trains, an extra train for them. Boston uh, didn't actually offer as much, but said they could use their top university talent to draw e-commerce there. Uh, Chicago was willing to pony up uh, $2.25 billion in incentives. Half of that would be offered in tax credits, and they could also get an additional $400 million for infrastructure spending. Um, they even went and they made got Captain Kirk himself, uh, <clears throat> who I, I, did I play Captain Kirk sing Christmas songs earlier? I think I did. Uh, a previous episode. Yeah, William Shatner did this whole thing. I'll play the Amazon video. It's so funny. Um, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this is the best. Columbus, Ohio. You are the most awesome city in America right now. So Columbus, Ohio says, well, okay, we'll pay you, uh, we'll give you a half a billion dollars. Um, and you can save, you know, some money on investment. We'll give you a 15 year, 3 to 5% income tax refund, which is about 50 million annually. Uh, that, that's the money part. That's the money part. Here's what also they said. Uh, quote, city officials also vowed to create a task force to prevent what Columbus refers to as an unacceptable murder rate. I'll read that again. An unacceptable <laughs> murder rate. That's right. They say, hey, Amazon. Amazon, if you come here, we'll, we'll investigate the murders. <laughs> People in Columbus are going to be like, what the... F <laughs> I had no idea. Why didn't you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> look, hey, and Amazon's like, look, Chicago got uh, Chicago got uh, Captain Kirk to come back. Uh, what do you guys offer? Um, um, we'll we'll stop all the murdering. We'll stop the murders. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll give you money to stop the murders. Oh my gosh, uh, there was a there's some more. That one is the best. I thought I <laughs> so it's like money, 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 and then <laughs> murders. I mean, they got, I think New York offered like way more than a billion. I probably had that wrong. Uh, it's just insane. It really is. I mean, Amazon's at a trillion dollar value. I mean, they play dirty recently. They uh, were going to pay minimum wage to all their people at 15 bucks an hour. But then he came out and says, now the government should do it. And basically they did this trying to, this is crony capitalism 101. They did this so that other companies that are as big as Amazon who can't eat $15 minimum wage uh, that they would crash. They couldn't do it. You know, it's the same strategy crony capitalism always does it, the, in big businesses. We do something to make the government happy. We use the government to punish the other companies. Just nasty. I mean, I have a story here about how Amazon workers in the Europe in particular are treated egregiously bad. Um, you know, in the UK, we have stories of, you know, pregnant women stand on their feet for 10 hours not allowed pee breaks uh and you know in buildings that are you know almost uh freezing temp just insane insane stories they really treat their workers badly at amazon uh, at least at the warehouses uh i mean in spain so they had these protests for black friday and amazon called in the spanish police to make the workers go to work 
Okay, that's like what they do in China, okay? If you're at Foxconn and you don't work, they call the law and the government forces you to work. I mean, it, it's slavery at Foxconn, by the way. China has lots of slavery and evils. Every evil in the world could probably be found in China. Um, yeah, and the Spanish police were like, that's not our job. <laughs> I mean, that's not my job. <laughs> They're like, okay, sir, that's not what we do. <laughs> Just ridiculous. Uh, Amazon, see, that's why Doctor Who made so much fun of Amazon. Now, I don't think it's got as much attention to the U.S. I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's, like, it's worse in the U.K. and Europe instead of here, but, yeah, that's what it is. All right, so let's end this. This is uh, Captain Kirk himself. This is my ending video for you guys. This is Captain Kirk, and he is telling Amazon what they will do to get them. press release writes itself, and there's something to be said for the poetry of it all. But we're not here to talk poetry, you sell plenty of that. 1994, a garage piled high with books, soon to be a vision beyond Earth's orbit, and with each new chapter, new skeptics, because the skeptics never stop. They try to count us out too, maybe you heard about the fire, did we cry uncle? Before the architects finished the plans, we began rebuilding and reinventing ourselves as an economic powerhouse, a thriving ecosystem of transit and tech, an icon of culture and community, and a destination for doers and dreamers alike. But here's the thing, we've still got the fire in us, and you've still got the garage in you. So let's talk reinvention together, because you do it relentlessly, and there's no better place for it than the city built on it. Chicago. It's day one in the second city. All right, well, there we have it. Shatner, the man himself. That was actually a really cool ad. <laughs> I like that a lot. Thank you so much for listening to the Happy Warrior podcast today. I know this one was fact-heavy. I know this one was very in the in the fields and the grass. You know, it was hard to get through, um, but it was worth it. Okay, guys, now you have these facts. Now you can use them, and you can bring back Sandy to the debate and to the discussion of politics and what's going on in the world. Remember, do all this with kindness. You know, you, you know, um, what is what, what did, uh, if, uh, Teddy said, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. You know, you treat others you have to treat you. That's Jesus. Um, try to be kind while using the facts. You know, feelings do matter. Try to meet people and find common ground because we're all humans and we're all Americans. And try to uh, bring back sanity to the discussion. Build bridges. Uh, if you want to know more, if you want to talk to me, if you want to offer me cool stuff, if you want to propose to me, you know, I, pr I proposed earlier to Dr. Deborah So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can reach me at Twitter, which is Happy Warrior P. You can get me on Facebook, which is Happy Warrior Pete. And you can find me on my email, which is Pete at Happy Warrior.net. Again, Pete at Happy Warrior.net. Please uh, contact me with any ideas, questions, comments, things you want to see. I would love to do it. And if you don't want me to read it aloud in the show, I won't. I'll just answer it privately. Um, be sure, if, if you listen to this, go to iTunes, be sure to look up the Happy Warrior Podcast, put in a good review. The more good reviews, the better the show does. Share it all over the place. You know, grovel and p p beg your family and friends to listen to the Happy Warrior Podcast, please! Um, <laughs> and also, if you're online, be sure to say hi to my friend, um, producer Robert Melling. He's an amazing man. I'm so grateful to him for letting me do this podcast and for supporting me. Um, we have some exciting things about this podcast. They're on the horizon that we want to share with you, and I am excited to share them. Um, next episode, we were going to do poetry for the month, so every episode, I'm going to do uh, one or two poems. I have a great Kipling poem I'm excited to share with you, um, and I'm looking forward to giving that to you, my wonderful listener and audience. You know, God bless you. 
God bless this country. God bless the troops who have sacrificed sweat and blood for this sacred soil and our sacred liberties and rights as enshrined in the United States Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. Thank you for listening. Please, if you see a member of our military forces, police, firefighters, give them a handshake. Tell them thank you and wish them a good day. As I do for you, please take care. Until next time, this is the Happy Warrior Podcast with Happy Warrior Pete. Thank you for listening. The Happy Warrior Podcast, hosted by Peter Von Pischke, produced by Robert Mayling, a production of the Sioux Empire Podcast Network. Learn more at happy-warrior.net. A production of the Sioux Empire.com.